Hey, what's up, guys? It's the Amazing Bacon. Look, I've been wanting to grow my channel, kind of show a little bit more of my personality, a little bit more of my knowledge and things. And I know most of my stuff goes into music videos. And as I've seen, I don't really know as much about music as I thought I did. So I'm going to continue to grow my knowledge in that, continue to react to music videos and everything just like I have been. But I also want to start adding a little bit more content that maybe reaches out into more things that I'm knowledgeable about and things that I enjoy doing. For me, that's professional wrestling. A lot of people can hate on that all they want. I've been a wrestling fan since, shoot, I was probably three or four years old. Used to go to the USWA shows back in Louisville, down in Tennessee, stuff like that. That's what I grew up on. That's what I cut my teeth on. I grew up always being a wrestling fan. I was even a professional wrestler for a little bit myself. That didn't really pan out just because I started having a family young and decided it really wasn't worth the wear and tear on my body. There's times I wish I would have stuck with it, but... I'm glad that I didn't. I'm glad I made the decisions that I did. But long story short, to bring it all back around, that's what my knowledge is. That's what my passion is. That's something I really enjoy. A lot of people hate on it, and that's cool. If it's not for you, it's not for you. If you decide wrestling is not really something that you're into, just skip this video. There will be other videos that are. A lot of you guys have been hearing about this company, AEW. It's run by the Elite, which is Cody Rhodes, the Bucks, Kenny Omega, Adam Page, and some of those guys. And this is something that it's a brand new wrestling company, but it's creating quite a stir in the professional wrestling just world. And I wanted to kind of get in there, get my knowledge, my experience on the sport, kind of give my analysis on what's going on. So I checked out AEW Fight for the Fallen. And I'm going to let you guys know what I thought. All right, so first off is a quick introduction to this show. For a lot of you guys that kind of have been following AEW up to now, you already know. But for some of you guys that haven't, Fight for the Fallen was basically a show where they were doing as a charity, where they were raising money for victims of gun violence, especially there in Jacksonville. And I think a lot of people see this as them jumping on the SJW bandwagon, and I don't think it's that. They're not saying they support gun control, just that they support helping out gun violence victims. I think that's an important delineation to be made there. But I think overall, it's a really, really great thing. We'll get into at the end exactly how much money they raised. But for an upstart company already raising money for communities and things, I think that that shows a really, really good idea of where their mindset is as a company. But anyways, jump straight into the pre-show. We're going to start off, it was Sonny Kiss versus Peter Avalon and Leva Bates, also known as the Librarians. There, there wasn't really a whole lot to this match. There wasn't really any backstory or anything like that. It was basically just a, a chance to kind of introduce the world a little bit to Sonny Kiss. And for those of you guys that aren't aware, he does have a very flamboyant, very feminine... Um, kind of a, a gimmick that he does. He came out with the Jacksonville Jaguars cheerleaders, danced his way to the ring. And I know that some people are probably going to be made a little bit uncomfortable by that because it's treading into, like, un, unadventured lands. Uh, I, I don't think that AEW is doing bad in their introduction of him because they're not making his entire gimmick about his personal lifestyle choices. Yes, it's who he is, but he doesn't get sympathy for it, and it's obvious that he's not getting, like, pushed solely because of being a member of the LGBT community. I think that that's uh, something that shows a lot of where their mindset is, is just they're accepting of all people, as you see with him and with uh, Nyla Rose. Obviously, they're going to be accepting those, but not making it about their lifestyle, just about the fact that they're talented professional wrestlers. Anyways, all that over with. He ended up picking up the win over Peter Avalon. Like I said, it was a pretty short match. I, I didn't really time it, probably about five minutes or so. But he hit the, uh, the big kick, and then the split-legged, the splits off the middle rope, hit Peter Avalon with it, got to one, two, three. I think probably the biggest uh, storyline-driven thing that you see out of this match is at one point Sonny Rose got kicked out of the ring, and Leva Bates had the opportunity to kind of hit him a little bit, rough him up some. But she didn't. She picked him up, generally put him back in the ring, and that was something that Peter Avalon didn't really like. And if you're following the story so far of Peter Avalon and Leva Bates, then you'll know right now they're pushing for Peter is trying to gain 
the affection of Leva Bates by kind of being her lackey a little bit. And so I think that, that showed a little bit of that rift. It's going to create some character-driven building. And overall, I think that that's a good thing because even though it wasn't that long of a match, it gave us a chance to learn who these characters are, kind of see what they were about, but not spend a whole lot of time on it like you would see in other situations. <laughs> The next match was Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, and Riho versus B. Priestley and Shoko Nakajima. Now, Riho and Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, have been at the past shows. They were actually at uh, Fighter Fest a couple of weeks ago, whereas Shoko Nakajima and B. Priestley, they've both been signed to the company, but they hadn't made their debut. I think that this overall was a... Uh, it was a good opportunity to show who these ladies were to an, uh, an audience that hadn't been exposed to them before, but this is my big complaint about this match. I think they went out there, and it's not that they were trying to go above and beyond what their actual talent level was. I think what happened is they got kind of caught up in the pressure, and you noticed a lot of rush moves. There was a lot of just sloppy moments, and it, it wasn't that... It wasn't that they couldn't do it. It was just kind of some missteps. And whether that was because of the international communication barrier, I'm not sure what was going on there, but it just it, it wasn't any of their best performances. Uh, I think that overall it kind of hurt them. I think that Shoko Nakajima and B. Priestley picking up the win was a good way to introduce them for the first time to the AEW audience. I just feel like it could have went a little bit better. So I, I'm kind of split on this one. I'm glad they got a chance to shine, but I wish that they didn't feel so rushed and feel like they had to get so much done in such a short period of time because overall I feel like it really hurt the flow of the match and it hurt the quality of the match just because it wasn't as smooth as it could have been. Now, afterwards, um, B, Priestley, and uh, Dr. Britt, they got into an uh, altercation afterwards, had to be pulled apart by their tag team partners, and I think that that's the build of a good program there because for those of you guys that don't know B Priestley, she's a very physical wrestler. She's got a lot of strength and a lot of intensity. And I think that that is going to be a good counter to um, Dr. Britt because she's kind of the same way in a lot of ways, but she's kind of like, obviously, you know, face versus heel, but she's kind of like the good to be Priestley bad, where B Priestley has a lot of the dark symbology and stuff like that. You know, Dr. Britt, obviously, being a dentist and things like that, she's about the healing. So you got kind of the healing versus the hurting, and I think that's going to end up being a good program. Um, overall, good attempt, bad execution. So it kind of, to me, ended the pre-show on a little bit of a bad note, but I don't think it hurt enough that it drew people away from wanting to watch the product. All right, so before the buy-in officially came to an end, Kip Sabian had an interview segment in the back, and I thought that it was actually a really, really strong showing by Kip Sabian. We haven't had a chance to really see a whole lot from him personality-wise or on the mic-wise in his previous matches where he was just kind of thrown in there. So I thought that this was a really good chance for the general audience, the ones that were watching the free buy-in and stuff like that, to really see, because he started out a little bit light, you know, with joking about the Tony Chimmel, you know, the Kip super bad Sabian. I thought that that was really funny. I thought the way he played it off was really funny, but then he kicked into that serious gear where, as he was saying, he didn't want to just be known as the best from his country. He wanted to be known as the best in the world. And he brought up a lot of really, really valid points for a face to make about the elite, about how Hangman is only in the position he's in because of his buddies from the elite and stuff. And I think that it, it kind of got the crowd to where they would accept him. They would accept kind of his personality where he believes in himself and he wants to prove himself. And I thought that it was a really, really good showing, good work on the stick. And overall, I was pretty impressed with it for somebody who hadn't really heard much of him before. Um, after that, there wasn't really a whole lot that went on. Uh, they did the cold open, which I thought was uh, very well done so far. Every one of AEW's cold open videos have been really, really good. Uh, I was kind of surprised they didn't mention something about it being a charity event. I thought that they would, but they focused more on the action, which actually is a good thing. But I think maybe it's just because we're so used to seeing what we see out of professional wrestling where they're constantly shilling something that that was why it seemed strange. But overall, it was a really, really good, good video. 
and um, it led us into the show whenever JR came out, and it was Excalibur, um, Alex Marvez, and JR, and I know a lot of people weren't really pleased with Alex Marvez during his last performance, which was at Double or Nothing, and there was a lot of concerns over the commentary, so we'll watch throughout the show, and we'll see how that commentary turned out, and uh, I'll give you my thoughts on that at the very end. But all that being said, it's time to move on to the main card at AEW. Fight for the Fallen. The first official match on the main card was MJF, Sammy Guevara, and Sean Spears versus the trio of Darby Allen, Jimmy Havoc, and Joey Janela. Now, the story kind of going into this was obviously that Sean Spears did not get along with MJF, partially because MJF is Cody's best friend. Whenever Sean Spears hit Cody in the back of the head, MJF was one of the first ones to come out. And so Sean Spears took it personally because he doesn't like Cody. So he felt like by taking Cody's side that MJF was going against him. So I think that that was actually really, really clever on the part of AEW because it showed just because you're a heel doesn't mean you have to get along. You can totally dislike each other. And that's how that works. You can have multi-level, multi-faceted heel work. And I think it was really impressive that they factored that into the storyline. Um, where on the other side, you had Darby Allen, Jimmy Havoc, Joey Janela, all three guys that are known for basically being completely insane and willing to do anything. I think Darby Allen had a career making performance against Cody two weeks ago at Fighter Fest, where he took the coffin drop. He did a lot of the other stuff. He took that massive throw out of the ring and he just showed that he belongs. Stature wise, he's a smaller guy. He's going to have to work harder and fight harder to prove that he belongs. And I think the performance at Fighter Fest really showed that he belonged, but this was his chance to show that like he was there to stay. Joey Janela, we all saw what Joey Janela did with um, John Moxley. Obviously, we know he's crazy. We know that Jimmy Havoc's crazy. So the whole kind of narrative going into it was these guys, they're all crazy, so they're going to get along versus these three heels that don't get along because they all have different agendas, so how would it all play out? And that's exactly how it ended up playing out, is MJF and Sean Spears showed their little problems throughout it. MJF did the cartwheel with the perfect 10, and Sean Spears ended up going to get a tag. MJF blind tagged Tim to show them that they weren't on the same page. And I thought that their interactions in the match was perfect because not only did that build a future program after Sean Spears is done with Cody, but it also kind of showed the depth that AEW is willing to go with their characters. Instead of just the two-dimensional character building, they're willing to show that there are times when you're not going to get along with more than one person, or that just because you get along with this person doesn't mean you get along with that person. And I was actually really, really impressed by the depth of the character building that they did just within this match alone. I will say... For somebody who, aside from seeing Sammy Guevara on the pre-show um, at Double or Nothing, I didn't really know much about him. I hadn't really seen him that much before, and honestly, that's a problem that a lot of people are going to run into with AEW is a lot of these stars are new. They're, they've been wrestling for a while, just not in the mainstream, so they're going to be names that people don't know. Sammy Guevara was the highlight of this match. He, he did just all sorts of crazy stuff. There was moments when he was just diving off one side and then flipping off the other side and just going way out of his way to really become the highlight of this match. I thought that this was a great, great showing from him and people in the future, whether it's the executives at AEW, whether it's on the independent level or whatever, I think that this is going to open up a lot of eyes to what Sammy Guevara is capable of, and I think this match did a good job of that. Um, overall, at the end, uh, Sean Spears kind of just took control at the very end of the match. I thought that he ended up looking really, really strong. Um, it was a good look because there has been a lot of criticism from the internet fans that, oh, well, AEW picked him up and they're making him a big star, even though he didn't do anything in WWE. And though I think that's a valid, um, I think it's a valid argument. I think just the fact that Sean Spears has been wrestling for 17 years. He, he's been all over Canada. He was all over the American scene way, way before he got to NXT. So he has a lot to offer that a lot of people don't realize that he has to offer because he was saddled in WWE. And I think he's finally getting a chance to start showing some of that in AEW. And I think just towards the end of this match was just a glimpse of what we're going to end up seeing from him. 
He won with the DVD. Overall, I thought it was a pretty good match. I thought it was a good opening match because it got the crowd into it, got them fired up, and there's you know not much more you can hope for an opening match than that. I think they did a good job. I, I have no complaints. I didn't remember seeing any spots where they were like fumbling over each other, where there's miscommunications. Good match overall. All right. Brandy versus Allie. I didn't come into this one with real high hopes because this was the first card where you saw a lot of people bringing up the criticism of um, nepotism because of being related to the elite. And a lot of people felt like Brandy didn't necessarily deserve to be at this spot on the card, especially when you have people like Britt Baker, Riho, B. Priestley. When they're on the, the buy-in, I can see why people would feel that way. That being said, the video package they did before this match where they showed, you know, Brandy, like, battling her personal demons, her mental demons, all that stuff, uh, to overcome and to become a wrestler, I think it built up sympathy for her, and I think that's exactly what they was going for, because if you watched Being the Elite leading up to Double or Nothing, then you saw where she was, like, calling the other women wrestlers and saying, hey, you're the one that's going to win, and backing them up. But what she was doing is being very manipulative throughout the whole thing by building each of them up individually just to manipulate them to get what she wanted. And I feel like this played out perfectly into that, played out perfectly into her gimmick, especially whenever her and Allie came out and then Awesome Kong's music hit. Awesome Kong came out to back up Brandy. And so it turned out it was a lot more of that mental kind of playing around and I, I really liked that because it added that needed depth where instead of just being, oh, well, that's Cody's wife or that's the chief brand officer, it was now we're starting to see what her true motives are, what her, you know, her idea, her mindset is. I really liked that. Um, I felt like the match could have been better, honestly, but I think that it was taking two wrestlers that they're not that experienced. It was much more of a story driven match, which is when. Uh, awesome Kong interfered a couple of times on Brandy's behalf. Ended up costing Allie the win. Brandy got the win. Uh, it was the, I think they call it the bionic spear because she has a surgically repaired clavicle. Uh, it, short match. It was kept short, relatively short and sweet. So I didn't think it did too much damage. But the biggest factor of this match was what happened after the match. And that was when they was doing the beat down or getting ready to do the beat down. Uh, awesome Kong grabbed Allie. They were gonna, um, they were gonna tear her up, beat her up, all that stuff. Music hits. Nobody knows who it is. Turns out it's Asia Kong. Um, Asia Kong comes down face to face. Awesome Kong kind of backs up and then acts like she's gonna swing at her. Asia Kong like doesn't back up, doesn't flinch, nothing like that. Finally, Brandy pulls Awesome Kong off. So I thought that that really showed like. They're going to build towards that storyline, and that's a match that if you've ever been a fan of Joshi wrestling or of Awesome Kongs in the past or anything, that's that's going to be a, a hell of a knockdown drag out fight, and I can't wait to see it. I'm glad they started building it up. Hopefully we find out more about that about All In, but the match was more about the story building, so I'm not going to get too upset over the fact that it wasn't that great of a match. <laughs> Next match on the card was the Dark Order versus Angelico and Evans versus Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, or a boy and his dinosaur. Um, Marco Stunt came out with Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. He would end up factoring in a little bit. I'll get to that. But overall, there was a few key points that came out during this match. This was a really, really good six-man match. I think Dark Order showed me a lot more than what they had a lot of people because a lot of people weren't used to them as being the Super Smash Brothers and PWG. If you don't watch independent wrestling, you just saw these guys show up and you didn't know who they were. So this was a good showcase for them. Um, I, I don't personally feel like the right team went over in this case because Dark Order did win to get a first round bye in the tag team tournament this fall. Um, if it was up to me, I would have given it to Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus just because it, it's obvious. Jungle Boy is super talented. He's over with the crowd. He's got everybody's support and everything that I can say about Jungle Boy, I can say times two about Luchasaurus. Luchasaurus is just, he is a star in the make. That He's over with the crowd. He's got the way to pump them up. He can get them behind them. 
his moves look smooth. I can't really say anything bad about the guy. If you saw his work in Lucha Underground, unfortunately it came to a weird end because Johnny was it what Johnny Impact now, I guess he goes by. Um because Johnny Impact beheaded him and killed him, and that's how he was written out of Lucha Underground. And I like Lucha Underground, but some of their storylines went too far crazy. But anyway, I digress about all that stuff. Luchasaurus is a star in the making, and I think that he's somebody that the company can get behind in the long run. He's going to be a merch mover. He's going to be a, you know, a ticket seller. And I think this was a, a great match to showcase what he's capable of, not only move-wise, but ability just to play the crowd, to get him behind him. And I think overall, he's probably the one that's shown the most. I will say Jungle Boy, as always, as he did um, in the the pre-show Battle Royal at uh, Double or Nothing and his match a couple weeks ago, he showed that he can do a lot. Overall, I think that the, the future is really bright for the tag team division just looking at these three tag teams. Because obviously Angelico and Jack Evans, they're crazy. They can do pretty much anything they want. Um, if you've been following all the way through their careers, they're very talented. But here's my first issue, my first main issue with this show. I try not to be too negative. But Marco Stunt got involved, and um, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head which one of the Dark Order it was, but he attacked him, did a Hurricane Rana off the top rope, right there in plain view of the referee. Even the announcers were confused. There was no disqualification or anything. The, the referee didn't disqualify him for whatever reason, um, but just kicked him out of the match, and I didn't I, I didn't personally like that. I'm, I'm a big fan of continuity, and um, you know, obviously traditional professional wrestling says if somebody else interferes and strikes one of the competitors in the match, then they get disqualified. So I didn't really care for that. The only thing that I could possibly see coming out of that is the fact that it was a triple threat, and in traditional triple threat matches, it's no DQ. But if it's no DQ and a triple threat, then he shouldn't have been kicked out just for the simple fact that there's no DQ. So I feel like there was a little bit of a continuity issue there that could have been explained a little bit better. But that's a minor gripe about a great match. Uh, overall, I think it was a really, really strong match. Built up all three teams really well. And like I said earlier, the tag team division is looking great in AEW. <laughs> So the next match, Hangman Adam Page versus Kip Super Bad Sabian. This was a good match. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. This, this was a, a good match. Um, I feel like it, it could have been better if maybe the crowd was a little bit more into it, but it was a good match, especially knowing the fact that Adam Page has the AEW title shot at All Out against um, Chris Jericho. I think... If you came into this match thinking that he was going to lose, obviously you were wrong because they're not going to have him lose right before his show. I feel like that kind of hurt the match a little bit. And also, my biggest complaint with Adam Page is he's another one where people talk about the elite showing favoritism to their friends. Everybody knows Adam Page is in the elite, so he's got a high spot on the card. Here's my complaint about that. I don't feel like Adam Page is clicking with the fans the way that they thought that he was going to. If you look at some of the other people in AEW on this card and how they get reacted to by the fans, I don't feel like he's as big of a star as what they're wanting to make. him. And I, I don't mean that personally. I feel like he has the potential to be that at some point. But I feel like if he wins the AEW championship for the very first champion, it's not going to get as big of a reaction as if somebody else did. And I feel like that's something that maybe they should have considered instead of doing the whole spoon-fed, this is the guy we're building our company around. They should have had for the first and then the second show built up and seen organically who the crowd reacted to the most. Because I think then you would see that the title picture was going to end up being a lot different than what it ended up being. So I feel like that kind of hurt the flow of this match is just the fact that everybody already knew he was winning because they already know he's the chosen. And I don't personally care for that kind of mindset, but I understand why they're doing it. It's just something they should have thought about if they were going to go with this mantra of we care what the audience says, we care what people think. Anyways, all that being said, it was a great match. Technically, it was a good match. The knee injury was sold by Adam Page really well, really well. 
I feel like there was a couple of times where maybe there was people that probably thought that maybe it was legitimate because he did do the little things like instead of just sliding out of the ring, he slowly walked down the stairs to lower the impact on his knee. And I think that he did the right things well. So I, I not disagreeing with him being the winner. I just feel like maybe his time to the main event was rushed when you have other players I feel like could have done a better job. But back to this match, I feel like this was a good showing for Kip Sabian. Uh, this match had a 20-minute time limit. It went 19, what was the official time? 19.03. That's just about as close to getting a draw as you can get without, you know, being named Darby Allen. Overall, it was a good match. The Kind of another, as you see, a theme of another big piece of news came afterwards when a member of the Dark Order, one of the Creepers, came out and attacked uh, Hangman Page. I think pretty much everybody knew when the guy slid in that it was Chris Jericho. Then obviously he hit the code breaker and people were like, oh, well, of course. And that was when the announcers, you know, recognized that it was Chris Jericho. The only issue that I have with that whole thing. Well, two issues. First off, Chris Jericho already did the whole jumping under a mask thing when he dressed as Pentagon Jr. And he jumped Kenny Omega, you know, back at uh, All In. So I feel like that was kind of a repeated thing. But the problem that I mainly have about this show in particular is when he first slid in the ring, the camera caught him dead on. Mask or not, if you know Chris Jericho, there was no doubting who it was. Like, you saw his eyes, you saw his eyebrows. There was no surprise element to it. I think everybody watching obviously would have known that it was Chris Jericho, but just the fact that I feel like if they would have hit a different camera angle, it probably would have been a better element of surprise. It's a minor gripe, but I do feel like it could have been executed a little bit better than it was. When it comes to SCU versus the Lucha Brothers, I just want you to stop and take a moment to think about something. The least experienced person in this match has been wrestling for 12 years. That's saying a lot. Because when you have four guys... Five if you count Daniels, that's been wrestling for as long as these guys have. Ray Phoenix, Pentagon Jr., 12 years. Uh, Kazarian, 17 years. Scorpio Sky, I think it's like 16 or 18 years. Christopher Daniels has been wrestling for 26 years. That's a lot of experience in the ring at the same time, and this match showed it. They did all the little things right. They linked together, they worked together, and as the announcer said, they have worked together in the past, but it was Kazarian and Daniels, not Kazarian and Scorpio Sky. But overall, this was probably my favorite match of the night, and I may be a little bit partial just because I'm a huge fan of SCU and specifically Daniels. I've been a huge mark for Daniels for, shoot, probably 13 years old whenever I started, like, caught his eye back when he was at uh, LA doing his thing. But... Um, overall, I think they did a good job. This is again, though, where that continuity issue that I came up with earlier with three-way tag team match creeped its way into this match. Christopher Daniels, even though he was struck first by uh, Pentagon of Phoenix with the double super kicks, I, I do find it kind of weird that he hit the Arabian moonsault and all that stuff, and then he was just kicked out, but there was no disqualification. So, again, with the continuity, earlier, if you were going to use the excuse of, well, it's a triple threat, there's no disqualifications, that's why we didn't disqualify Marco Stunt for getting involved. This was just a one-on-one. -on -one. So, if Christopher Daniels is going to get involved and get physically, like, physically attack the members of Lucha Brothers, then technically he should have been disqualified. So, they really, really need to work on establishing their rules better. And I know that this is only their third show, but just the fact that these are little details that people notice that, especially when your announcers are bringing it up, you need to address in some way, form, or fashion. That's really the only bad thing, kind of like the three-way tag earlier. That's really the only bad thing about this match, I can say. But it is something, as a wrestling fan that's been watching for a long time, as somebody that used to do it myself, that these are the little things that need to be explained, need to be kind of, like, addressed in order for the fans to know. Because, yes... We're going to suspend our, our belief. We get that. But there's still logic. Logic is a very, very important thing in wrestling. So I feel like that was kind of a big hit for AEW. 
that type of stuff needs to be taken care of. Those loose ends need to be tied up before we move forward and we start hitting the weekly TV show. Us as viewers, we need established rules and things that we understand going into it. Anyways, I don't want to be negative about this match because this was a good match. Like I said, it was probably the best match on the card, in my opinion. So, you know, Lucha Brothers, obviously, they did their thing. The Lucha Brothers are arguably one of the best tag teams on earth. The fact that all of these guys at their age performed at the level that they did was just insane. I have nothing bad to say about this match. Um, afterwards, Lucha Brothers, which I thought was a little bit strange because to me, attacking SCU with ladders, knocking them out and stuff like that, I felt like that was kind of a heel move. And so I don't know if they're kind of working on a tweener thing. So they made the challenge to the Young Bucks for a ladder match for next month at All Out. I don't know if maybe they're trying to work it up to where the Young Bucks are going to get the top and the Lucha Brothers are going to play the part of the heel. I don't know. But I just I felt like that was kind of out of character for them. Um, them getting up on the ladder afterwards and talking about being the best uh, tag team in the world, best tag team in the universe. I don't, I don't have a problem with that because that's just being proud. But the attack itself, kind of wondering where they're going with that. Could be good, could be bad. I guess we'll know when we get there. But Long story short, that's building up to the Young Bucks versus the Lucha Brothers. Again, kind of a rematch from Fighter Fest, but this time it's going to be in a ladder match. Uh, that, that should be pretty interesting. I don't know which way they're going to play that, whether they're going to have like a contract for a title match uh, on the line or what. But overall, their, their build just builds itself. They wrestled, you know, at Triple Mania with Triple A, they wrestled. In AEW already, now they're looking to wrestle again in a ladder match. Those teams work just amazingly together. So uh, looking forward to that. And overall, can't say anything bad about the match other than that one little thing that I brought up earlier. Kenny Omega versus Chima. I'll tell you right now, if there is one guy on the card that is not a member of the Elite, that should be having larger matches, it's Chima, and he proved it here. This match was physical. They beat the hell out of each other. Um, you saw him spill it all the way to the outside. Chima hit the Meteora off the upper level onto the table onto Kenny Omega. Um, that was kind of one complaint that I had, is the fact that there was roughly 17,492 Meteoras in this match, who's counting. Um, so I didn't really care for that, just because I don't like dipping into the well too many times, because eventually the water gets muddy. Um, so I feel like that could have been done a little bit better, like maybe a better um, array of moves. But that is one complaint in a match that overall went really well. I think that Kenny Omega actually took a lot more abuse in this match than I thought he would. I figured with coming into the match with John Moxley that they was going to build him up to be really strong. I thought it was going to be a lot shorter match than it was. I didn't think necessarily it was going to be a squash match, but I thought that he would end up performing a lot stronger and a lot more dominant over Chima than what he did. He played the face in peril for the majority of the match, and he kept you know sneaking out and all that where, like, Chima went to do the Meteor off the top rope. Kenny Omega caught him, used that strength, uh, hit the V-trigger. So, like, he was able to do those those kind of face build pops and stuff like that. I thought that it went really well. Um, I feel like, like I said, the move set could have been a little bit more varied. But overall, it was a good match. I think it did end up making Omega look stronger in the end because it was a harder-fought match. So, in that one, I'll take the L on that one. My opinion was wrong. It, it should have went exactly how it went. It made Kenny Omega look better just for the fact that it made Chima look so much better. Um, good, good match. Uh, I think that there was one spot in that match that um, they were up on the middle rope, and originally it looked like Chima was in a reverse Rana position, and then he turned around and he hit the sunset flip off the middle rope onto Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega took an ugly bump on the back of his neck. At first, like, I was surprised the announcers didn't make a bigger deal out of it than they did. But I, I understand where these guys are coming from. A lot of these guys are coming from Japan with the Pure Resu and all of that, where they're used to stiffer shots and all that. But here's the thing. If you're going to start doing weekly television, especially if it's going to be live, 
you got to stop taking these head and neck, like these Snapdragon um, bumps and stuff like that, because you're going to shorten your career. If you're doing this every single week, it's different than in NG, NJPW where you're doing it once a month or where you're wrestling a match like every couple of months or something like that. Like I, I understand where they're coming from, but this is where the WWE style makes sense is because you're doing it all the time now. Please, for the sake of your career, your life, your livelihood, don't take bumps like that unnecessarily, especially when you're talking about people like Darby Allen doing that coffin drop on the ring apron. Like, Darby Allen did all of that stuff and, like, blew everybody's minds and had a career-making performance, took that coffin drop and just freaking bombed it. And then Sean Spears hit Cody with, in the head with a chair and everybody forgot about Darby Allen. I'm not saying that's Darby's fault, just like I'm not saying that it's Kenny Omega's fault that he took that bump. But what I'm saying, those bumps are dangerous, and they're limited for a reason. And Kenny Omega is one of those. He likes to make a show. He makes likes to go 100% all out every single time he's in the ring, and I don't have a problem with that. But going all out every time you're in the ring when you're in the ring once a month is different than going all out, giving everything you got when you're in the ring every single week. So just something to think about whenever they move forward we'll probably start seeing a lot less of these huge bumps that you've been seeing in the, you know, three programs they've had so far. So Jericho came out for the next segment. Um, I think everybody kind of saw, especially with him attacking Hangman Page, how this was going to go. Basically, it was Jericho coming out, you know, telling everybody he still wanted their their thanks and he still wanted their appreciation. And then, you know, he was trash talking Adam Page. Adam Page came out, beat him up. They got pulled apart. And uh, I think the biggest highlight of all of this is the fact that Paige, like, his eye, like, he was busted up pretty good. So I, I don't know if that just came from the match with um, Kip Sabian before or if it was from the Jericho attack or they just have somebody that's amazing at makeup. But, like, his face was jacked up, and so I felt like that added to the intensity, added to the realism of it overall. I think it went really well. Not a whole lot to say because the promo itself was pretty basic. The beatdown was expected. But that was the big thing to note there is, I mean, his face was pretty jacked up. So good stuff there. Main event of the evening. I think that a lot of people were kind of built up for this match because we all know how good the Bucks are. We all know how good Cody and uh, Dustin Rhodes can be. But as a team, we've only seen like a glimpse of the Brotherhood. So. A lot of time went into this match. I think they had a 60-minute time limit. They ended up going like 35 minutes. Um, they put a lot of time into it. And there's a few minor things as a longtime wrestling fan, as a former wrestler, that I noticed that I kind of wanted to point out. My very first thought coming into it, whenever I saw that they was making separate entrances for the Brotherhood, I said, I hope they at least have matching attire. And I know that that seems really, really minor, but... If you really want to make the transition from two individual wrestlers into one tag team and make people buy into the fact they're thinking as a team, you want them to match. That's whenever you see you know other wrestlers in other companies that it's two single stars and they jump into a tag team and they come out separately with separate music and one's wearing white and another one's wearing red and they don't look anything alike. You're like, okay, well, these are just two single stars that are working together. So I thought that was a really good touch that... You know, Dustin Rhodes and Cody came out in the black and red. I felt like it built that unity, and it kind of already gave that visual of the fact that they're working together as a team. Minor thing, but it's little stuff like that that's really, really important whenever you're building emotions into a wrestling match. I thought that was well done. Um, I Something else I noticed that I, I don't know if a lot of casual fans noticed or not, but the concern coming into this is who are people going to cheer? Are they going to cheer the Bucks or are they going to cheer Cody and Dustin Rhodes? Because they're both obviously very popular. They've both put a lot of time in, a lot of energy. Um, the Young Bucks, they debuted in 2006. Cody debuted somewhere, correct me if I'm wrong, around 2003, 2004. You know, Dustin Rhodes has been wrestling for 31 years. So these are all guys that have been doing it for a long time, so they've built up that status with fans where they're going to love them. You, you just reach a certain point in your career that no matter what you do, people are going to like you. So I feel like that's been a big issue for the Young Bucks in the past is they're not very believable heels. Like whenever they play the heels, you've got like Nick and Matt over there just being like, 
like that's their heel face like like bro you, you don't look believable as a heel when you're just going and you got mutton chops down to here like you look like a dork i love the young bucks i think that they're probably like arguably in the top five tag teams on the planet right now but that's just a gripe of mine is i can't take them seriously as a heel because they're you know i think see i, I want to say that Matt is 5'10", Nick is 5'11", maybe vice versa. They weigh 178, 179 pounds apiece. It makes it hard to be threatened. So when they tried to play the heel in this match, I think it showed a lot in the fact that they were able to get heat just for the fact that they're not natural heels. So I thought that they did a good job with that. But all that aside, the match itself, I feel like it was paced out really well, especially going 35 minutes the way that it did. Um, my main my major concern with Dustin in this match was just going to be that he couldn't keep up with the pace of the Young Bucks. And that's that's no knock against Dustin. It's just the fact that, you know, the Young Bucks are some of the fastest tag team wrestlers on the planet. They are all over the place. They're, they do everything. So it is hard to keep up with them, even if you're half Dustin's age. So I feel like the the pacing of this match, they did a really good job. They started out high pace. They slowed it down for a while. You notice there for a while Cody was the face in peril. That way Dustin and even the announcers mentioned he catches breath on the outside and things like that. I mean the guy's fifty years old. So the fact that he was hanging in there shows a lot of amazing talent, amazing ability and the fact that he's been working his ass off to stay at the level that he's at. Um I think that, that showed a lot of good stuff. So Overall, major props for how they timed and paced this match. I think it went really, really well. Maybe went like five minutes, a little bit too long, give or take. But I understand why they did it the way that they did for the simple fact that they wanted to tell that entire story. Here's my one complaint about this match. And it's something that some people will probably agree with me on. Some people probably won't. But if you're going to do an injury angle like they did with Nick's shoulder, I believe it was Nick, but I think it was Nick. Anyways, if you're going to do an injury angle like they did with him, where he was charging in, went for the spear in the corner, hit the shoulder, and then they worked over that shoulder for like the next 11, 12 minutes. And I'll give it to him. At the end of the match, he was still selling it and stuff. I don't have a problem with that. But here's my problem with that. Again, suspending belief. Logic is still a thing. When was the last time you saw either of the Young Bucks come charging in and go for a spear in the corner? You don't. That's not one of their moves. So why... All of a sudden, out of the middle of nowhere, would he go running in and try to hit a spear in the corner and mess his shoulder up? Like, there's, there's so many other moves that they could have done to get to that point. He could have grabbed the arm, went to go up to the ropes for the arm drag, for the moonsault to the outside, anything, and they just grabbed him and pulled him down and hung him up on the top rope. There's a lot of ways that they could have gotten to that that I feel like would have been a lot more believable than putting him into a situation where he would never put himself individually like that that doesn't make sense to me again small thing that probably you know only me and maybe a couple of other people noticed but it is stuff like that that if you're going to do an injury angle make it believable make it something where they would typically do that kind of move in order to cause the injury and i think that it would make it more believable anyways overall i still feel like it was a good tag team match um the end felt a little bit kind of like weirdly rushed uh, they hit the Meltzer driver, got the one, two, three. Um, the match went over well. Then afterwards, they started talking to um, the Brotherhood, and then the music hits. Everybody started coming down with the check, and he said on the mic, oh, I think we're out of time or whatever. And I, just, I thought that was kind of an awkward thing. Like, they spent time at the end of the show with Kenny Omega, like, doing some sort of weird promo trying to say goodbye to everybody that took, like, five minutes. But they couldn't give them the proper time on the stick. And to me, that was like a little bit awkward. And that goes into the production values, which I'll hit in a minute. But I just I feel like that part could have gone a little bit better. But overall, match was really good. Um, I, I was really happy with how the match turned out. A few final things on this uh, pay-per-view or non-pay-per-view, however you want to look at it. A few final things that come to mind, um, just stuff that popped out to me throughout the show. First things first, I loved the fact that for like the first 95% of the show, they didn't take any shots at WWE. There wasn't any of the throne breaking or the pot shotting or the talking about them on commentary. 
you didn't get that. They stood alone as an AEW show. And then all of a sudden, at the very end, Cody comes along and ruins it because he's got something in his head that says that he has to take shots at WWE. I don't understand. But he's like, oh, well, we won't be, you know, reprogrammed or whatever word he used talking about WWE doing the Evolve show or overproduced or something. I forget what he said. But I felt like that was really unnecessary. Everybody knows what's going on. Everybody gets it. It's, you know, competition. But when you keep saying in interviews, we're not competition, we're an alternative, then stop bringing it up. Like, you're hurting yourself because you went 95% of your show, not mentioning them, standing on your own merits, providing a really, really good product. And then in the last, you know, five minutes, you shoot yourself in the foot. I, why? That, that doesn't make sense to me. Stop doing that. WCW did that. ECW did that. TNA did that. Don't do it. It does not work out well. Like, think about that. Um, anyways, I, I feel like uh, Alex Marvez and Excalibur and JR, I feel like they did a lot better job on commentary. Uh, there were still a little miscues here and there, but I feel like it was better than their other showing. So overall, improvement i would still rather see a two-man team between jr and excalibur i'm not a big fan of three-man teams i don't think it worked for nitro it hasn't worked for wwe i can't think of a good three-man crew for wwe uh, basically ever uh that was any better than a two-man team so i personally i like a traditional two-man team but if they're stuck on having a three-man team i feel like this team's gonna get better and better i think alex marvez improved a lot over where he was and I feel like maybe we should give him a little bit of a chance because he is improving a lot. One thing that came to mind, and I know I just said not to compare yourself to AEW. I don't work for AEW, so I can compare them all I want. Here's one thing I noticed, and it's not that it's a bad thing, but it's the fact that there's a huge, huge size difference. When they talk about WWE being the land of the giants and we don't think about this stuff, like Luchasaurus is six foot six, and Goldust is six foot five. Goldust did not look big in WWE. He was constantly surrounded by people that were like 6'8", 6'10", 7 7 foot, 7 foot 4. He looked small. But you've got Sean Spears, Luchasaurus, and uh, Dustin Rhodes now, because he's not Goldust anymore. You've got them as like the biggest guys in your company, and it's a noticeable difference. Again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying like it really puts it in perspective when people say WWE is the land of the Giants, like, Holy crap, it's because they're the land of the Giants. Like, there's a huge size difference in the wrestlers. Um, again, not important for the quality of the programming. I feel like AEW's been putting out quality programming. I don't think it has anything to do with the size of their performers. It just, when you're seeing Luchasaurus standing in a ring and he dwarfs everybody around him and they act like he's a monster, I'm not saying 6'6 six, six isn't a monster, but he's not big by WWE standards. That's all I'm saying. Like, it just, there is a gap there between the size and the perception of the wrestlers that work for each individual. Um, I mentioned a couple of the pr production issues earlier, and I felt like they got better this time. There was still a couple of spots. Like I said, the Jericho thing, shooting straight on him in the mask. I felt like that was kind of a poor production issue. There was, I think, one or two times that I remember, like it seemed like music started to kick up and then shut off. And I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I felt like that was kind of a, a weird timing thing. Uh, there was a couple of times, I don't remember which match it was, but there was somebody on the top rope, somebody went up top for a kick, and they just barely caught it. And uh, it was just because the camera was still focused on this camera instead of the production truck focusing it over to this camera. Um, little minor stuff. I think that a lot of times we get like caught up on this and we're like, oh, well, AEW doesn't have near the production value and stuff like that. Like, true, they don't. Like, this is their third show. Like, we have to be patient. We're watching them grow. The fact that they've had three shows and they're going to have a national weekly television program in two months, like, we got to be patient. But at the same time, like, they're literally jumping both feet in. So it's something important to consider. Last thing um, before I, I wrap it all up is there's something that I think a lot of people need to realize about AEW. AEW does not have a whole lot of well-known household names. I'll give that to them. They got John Moxley. Most people still know him as Dean Ambrose. You got Chris Jericho. You know, to an extent, you've got the Young Bucks. You've got Kenny Omega. Some of these guys, but you know, the world for the most part doesn't know the Leva Bates. It doesn't know the B Priestleys. It doesn't know 
you know, Sammy Guevara or Kip Sabian or, you know, any of these guys that are building their careers. here. But something that I feel like a lot of people should consider is just because they're not a well-known name doesn't mean they don't know what they're doing. The years of experience that you have in AEW helping to build it is just insane. Um, I wrote a couple of the ages down just to put it into perspective. But, you know, it's like I was saying earlier, Sean Spears wrestling for 17 years. Gold Dust been wrestling for 30, or I said Gold Dust, but I wrote Dustin Rhodes, been wrestling for 31 years. You know, Daniels for 26 years. The Lucha Dragons for 12 years apiece. The um, Kaz for 17 years. You've got the Young Bucks, they're wrestling for 16 years apiece. You've got guys that have been doing this for a long, long time. And I think that overall that's going to help the product. But it's also going to make them more hungry because they haven't had a chance to have that national picture before. You've got guys that they're hungry, and that's going to make a big difference. So that's just something I wanted to point out. Even though you haven't heard of them, doesn't mean they don't know what they're doing. All right, so overall verdict. I would say Fight for the Fallen above and beyond was a pretty positive show. I would probably give it about a seven and a half out of 10. And that's because there was still the production issues. There was a couple of the hiccups on the logic issues and things like that. But overall, once you got to that main card, the matches were solid. The, when, the worst, when the worst match on the card was Brandy versus Allie, which I think everybody kind of expected, that's really saying something because there was a lot of storyline development and things like that that went into that match that really helped push AEW forward. But when you look at the other matches, you know, you've got Omega versus Chima that went really well. You've got the Young Bucks versus the Brotherhood that went really well. You had the three-way tag that built stars out of all six of the people in that match. You know, SCU versus Lucha Brothers. Obviously, you get any combination of the five of those guys into a ring. They're going to do amazing things. You know, Adam Page versus Kip Sabian. That was a star-making performance for Kip Sabian. I, I can't really say anything terribly negative about the matches or the performers themselves. What I saw as a negative was based on AEW as a company, which for a little bit, I'm willing to say we have to be patient. They're a brand new company. But here's my caveat to that. You may be a brand new company, but in two months, you're jumping both feet forward into a live weekly program. And whether you like it or not, you're going to be competition. You need to get these wrinkles ironed out. You need to get that stuff straight to where everything is lined up. You need to make logic make sense. Make these rules make sense. Give us a reason to care about your product. Aside from, okay, they're going to have great matches. But as we've seen in the past, great matches don't sustain a company. So, I get it. AEW is new. New is not an excuse when you've got a live weekly broadcast. Just something to consider. Overall, good job. I'm really glad that I watched it. I'm not going to keep you guys... You know, this video is already who knows how long it's going to be after I end up editing it out. But hopefully you guys are still here for the journey. Hopefully maybe I've given a little bit of insight to the show. If you liked what you saw, right down there in the corner, there's a subscribe button. You can follow me. You can like my stuff. I appreciate it. And until next time, this is The Amazing Bacon. And I'll talk to you later.